In this video, I'm going to continue to talk about the uses of conditional probability and following on on our example of breast cancer mammography. And at the end of the last video, we worked out the probability that an individual has cancer and they test positive, this sort of joint probability up here at the top, as 9 over 1,000. And we had pretty much worked out what is the marginal probability that an individual tests positive. So this is an individual lady who is drawn at random from a population of 40 to 50 year old women. And we'd worked out that this is the sum of these two terms here, the probability that an individual has cancer and they test positive, which is just that term above, and this other term here, which we'd also worked out, and we worked it out as 792 over 10,000. And if we sum together these two terms, we get that this is equal to 882 over 10,000. Then if we put all this together to help us to work out what is actually the probability that an individual who tests positive actually has cancer, which is this expression here, then we know what the numerator of this is. The numerator is just the 9 over 1,000, and the denominator here is 882 over 10,000. So if you were to put this into a calculator, you will get something which is approximately 0.1. But hold on, that's that's quite high, right? That's basically a 10%, or well, quite low rather, that's only a 10% probability that an individual who tests positive actually does have breast cancer. And this is actually a very realistic figure. This is actually not far from the true value. And it just shows how many false positives there are in breast cancer mammography. Uh, and in some extent, you can see why this has led a lot of people to say that we shouldn't actually be screening as much for breast cancer as we actually are. But this seems like a completely counterintuitive result because all of these probabilities up here in the top left, the probability that an individual actually has cancer, 1 in 100 seems about right. The probability that an individual doesn't have cancer, therefore 99 out of 100, that seems okay. The probability that an individual tests positive given that they actually have cancer is 90%, so that's, that's pretty good as well. The only thing that we're left with is what's the probability that an individual that doesn't have cancer, um, or what's the probability of them testing positive, and that's about 8%. And that still seems reasonably okay. So it seems odd that we've got such a small figure out of this. So what's the intuition for actually what's going on? So the idea here is that we can think about a group of 40 to 50 year old women. So let's imagine that we've got an individual one, then we've got another individual, call it individual two, and we've got let's say, to begin with, um, all the way up to the 99th individual, and then we've got one more individual. So we've got a 100 individuals to begin with. And let's say, actually, that we have a few layers of sort of people all standing in a row. So this is our first layer, then we have a second layer, which would also have a row of 100 women. And we continue all the way down to, let's say, we've got 100 rows of 100 women. So we've got in the 100th row, we've got the sort of first person all the way up to the 100th person again. So these are all the women in our sort of hypothetical um, population, if you like. Let's now think about the proportions of these individuals that actually are likely to have cancer. So we know that the probability that a randomly chosen individual from this population actually having cancer is 1 in 100. And we can see easily enough that this basically corresponds, if I use a slightly different colour, this corresponds just to, for example, taking the final column of women. That's one one hundredth of the women, right? So we can see straight away that the number of women that are likely to have cancer here is going to be roughly 100. So I'm going to say 100 is equal to the number of women, so the number that actually do have cancer. And we can see quickly enough that because of that, we know that the number of women that don't have cancer is going to be, in this case, 9,900. So because we've got a sample of uh, 10,000 women, the number of women that don't have cancer is going to be 9,900. So, okay, that's just starting off. That seems all fairly logically, uh, fairly logical, rather. Let's now consider each of these subgroups. So firstly, thinking about the group that have cancer, what proportion of this group are likely to test positive? Well, we know that the proportion of individuals that do actually have cancer that test positive is roughly 90%. So we know that here, this is going to then imply that roughly something like 90 
uh, of these 100 women are going to be about the number of women who are positive um, given that they actually have cancer. So that's 90 individuals. So that's a pretty good success rate within the group that actually do have cancer. Let's now think about the other group, the group that don't have cancer. So for the group that don't have cancer, there is also this risk of false positive, and we know that that occurs roughly 8% of the time. So what this actually implies is that because we've got 9,900 women, a lot, of, a lot of women that don't have cancer, that's actually going to mean that we're going to have 9,900 times 8%, which is going to give us a figure of 792 women are actually going to test positive even though they don't have cancer. So these are all the sort of false positive results here. So now we kind of see the intuition because there are loads of people who actually test positive because we're dealing with quite a big group, but only quite a small fraction of them are the ones that actually do have cancer. Only this 90 out of a total here of, or if you imagine adding these two things together, so 90 out of the product or the sum rather of 90 plus 792, which is 882, which gives us roughly a figure of 10%. So the reason that we're actually getting such a high value is really due to the risk of false positive. So it's actually this probability up here that is causing this relatively low result in terms of the proportion of people that do actually have cancer, given that they've tested positive. So if we really wanted to tackle this sort of risk of, um, well, this relatively low percentage of women that actually do have cancer given that they've tested positive, that probably tells us that if we can make improvements which reduce the risk of false positive, then it's going to be really sensitive to any significant reductions in this particular probability.